Game boards, objects, view like pawns to be change up our mindset. Value of the dollars at the center of this conflict. Their lives only matter if they serve to make a profit. But if the midget sees further on the shoulders of the giant, then we should see further than the tyrant and build a future within the lions. With success is our science in the quest to go higher. It's the heart of the city. Wake up, world. Welcome to another episode of Heart City TV. I'm your host, Malik Boyd. I hope that wherever you are, you are in good spirits and all is truly well. The show topic today is an amazing one. Uh, we're dealing with painting progress. How do we paint progress across the landscape of our community, the canvas of our community? Uh, our guests are absolutely amazing. They're going to tell you their story about how they're doing exactly that in their areas of the world now for those who can see this shirt it's a warnock life if you've been following any of the election cycle you know in georgia there is a major uh senate runoff race uh rafael warnock who is a reverend at ebenezer baptist which is the church that the reverend dr martin luther king uh once pastored is running for u.s senate also john uh ossoff as well is running for senate however this shirt here Shout out to the DNC, Mike Blake, and the team who are doing tremendous amounts of work to rally the vote and get folk engaged. You can find that shirt online. It's a Warnock Life. You can find them on IG uh, and the various outlets as well. And that shirt can be purchased. But more importantly, tell everyone you know to get out and vote. The runoffs are really crucial because many people unfortunately feel as though once they vote in the primary and then definitely vote in the general i don't have to vote in the runoff i've done too much well in this case uh, too much is never enough get out and vote why does that matter right now for those who are looking at the landscape of senate and quite frankly if you were looking for a two thousand dollar stimulus check you know that the senate uh is going to pretty much deny anything that passes out of the house in reference to the stimulus bill. Why? Because they have the majority. In order to actually even the playing field and have uh, Vice President elect Kamala Harris to serve as the deciding vote, they've got to get it to 50-50. Right now, they have to get these two seats, John Ossoff and Reverend Raphael Warnock. They have to get them elected in order to be able to push an agenda that addresses some of these issues that we've talked about for years, quite frankly, and definitely all this year. So if you know anyone in the Atlanta, Georgia area, uh, in, in, in Georgia, quite frankly, period, Georgia proper, get them involved. Tweet them, call them, uh, IG them, TikTok, whatever you have to do, let them know it is time to get out and vote. Now, that's not the only issue that we're dealing with across America. If we're gonna be honest, uh, we still have lives being lost at the hands of police. We just witnessed this yet again, an unarmed man being shot, uh, cell phone in hand, and it presumably being uh, considered a weapon because it was dark and the officer is basically reporting, well, I, I saw something, he ran, I shot him in the back. And then even as this man lay bleeding out, lay bleeding out, the officers say, well, put your hands up. It's kind of hard when you shot me in the back um, and, I'm, and I'm struggling for my life. Yet we find that our reality once again, and I am I'm beyond frustrated with uh, the techniques that are being used. Obviously, officers do have to come home and we honor those who risk their lives every day. $56,000 is not enough to put my life on the line every day. I, I'll be very honest with you. And so those that do that and do it honorably, we honor you. Um, but there are different procedures that have to happen, especially as it relates to communities of color, whether or not fatal cases happen more in the black community versus others. The issue is the treatment of individuals that lead to death. 
um, are drastically different when we deal with communities of color. And so that is happening again, as well as a landscape that is changing politically. We have a new administration coming in and we have to navigate how we're going to handle that in the middle of dealing with COVID and changing our environment and, and what this new environment will be. That's on the table. But if you're in any local municipality, town, rural area, you have your own challenges whether it be local elections, whether it be local budgets, whether it be funding of schools, how to get our kids back to school, we all have something to deal with and to talk about. And so if you know anything about this show, we always start the show off in prayer. To that end, I am going to lead us into our last prayer for the city for the month of December and for the year 2020. Heavenly Father, we come before you uh, just to say thank you, knowing that this day is not promised, we offer it back to you from whence it came. We ask you now to be with us in this moment. Give us the words to say, but then also allow us to turn it into action, whatever our conversations may be. Whatever our focus may be, allow it to be right and true and allow it to have impact on your children, your kingdom. You already know these moments. You already know these issues. You already know the solutions because you are the solution. You are the one who provides. So we ask you now for provision. More importantly, knowledge, wisdom, and understanding, knowing how to apply what we know so that we can be a better race, be a better culture, be a better community, be a better world. These issues are pressing, but they are not, not insurmountable. We know that we can achieve all things through you. And so we throw everything up to you, knowing that you will deal with it and pour out, quite frankly, a blessing that we will have overflow. We won't have room enough to receive it. We are committed to you. We are focused on you and we know that you will bring the necessary outcome. And so we ask you to bless the guests on this show. Bless those who are watching. Allow us to uh, find ourselves safe as we go into this new year, and more importantly, more of a cohesive unit so that we can be the kings and queens that we talk about on a daily basis. And we will forever give your name the honor and praise. Amen. So thank you for those who uh, followed us all week long, shouted out, um, tweeted us, retweeted us. Uh, there's, there's, tons of stuff to talk about. I know some of you guys want us to talk about some of the issues that we did have conversation with on Messenger. We'll try to bring some of that up, but we have some amazing guests and we want to make sure that we get to them. And so what I'm going to do, I have to pay some bills. When we get from that portion of our show, Dr. Asia Johnson is on the other side and our brother, Malcolm Manning, you know him as well. Uh, he made, quite frankly, the Twitter feed break. He said, I'm going to tweet out that I need support. I'm ready. I'm capable of doing the work. I just need support. And uh, Big Mama showed up, Oprah Winfrey. She retweeted him and the rest is history. You'll hear about that amazing story as well. I am paying bills, headed to a break. Take out your stethoscope. You're watching Heart City TV. We'll be The most human trait is to want to know why. And in a year that tested everyone around the world, why was searched more than ever. The spread of the coronavirus has passed a significant milestone. And while we didn't find all the answers, we kept asking. Some questions inspired joy. Others, excitement. Life in the bubble. Yes. In a me? Yes. In a me? Yes. I don't know what an improper fraction is. Teachers should make a billion dollars. We found politics, y'all. Oh, my God. Put it on there and start it up for me. What are y'all doing? Yeah! It's still March. How many days in March? Some questions made us cry. You know, we've been through our ups and been through our downs. I think the most important part is that we all stay together throughout. I love you guys. Some made us worry about this spinning rock we call home. Fires were detected in the Amazon rainforest. 
Why were so many lives lost? Almost 1.5 million people have now died of COVID-19 worldwide. Why are we still asking the same questions? George Floyd, George Floyd repeatedly told the officers that he could not breathe. So why do we still have strength to continue? I believe in your power. I believe in our power. I believe in our power. Chants of Black Lives Matter echoed from thousands of protesters in cities around the world. Why are we not defeated? We have made too much progress, and we are not going back. We are going forward. Planes are starting to arrive in Beirut, full of international aid. Firefighters from around the world arriving in California. There are over 100 coronavirus vaccines in development worldwide. This is one of those times when people look out for one another and have each other's backs. We kept going for those who showed us the way. Think about how you would like the world to be for your daughters and granddaughters. Remember, the struggles along the way are only meant to shape you for your purpose. Press on with pride and press on with purpose. Why is it that this year showed its worst and we still found ways to triumph? An incredible feat for Maya Gaviera. Naomi Osaka, U.S. Open Championship. Can't let Corona stop you. Can't let quarantine stop you. So until we get to every answer... We're still searching. We're back. You're watching Heart City TV. I absolutely love that commercial, especially that little girl that's like, you love me? That <laughs> made the rounds uh, throughout our community. And, and yes, that Google commercial brings about all of the experiences that we have uh, dealt with all throughout 2020. This guy here. I, I need you to understand this dude. I, I got to get some space from him. Now, if you're anywhere in the Philly area, uh, I kind of need some space because we're dealing with COVID. But this guy is. He is the meme of 2020 and ultimately probably the culmination of what 2020 has been. So I, I got to give a shout out to Colt Shaw, who is a journalist right here in Philly. Billy Penn reported about this particular monk. Now, Colt is the one who created the meme. Now, everyone talks about, you know, well, I started this meme or I created this trend. Colt is definitely the guy who put this together. This monk, Colt recognized this photo. It, it is a long standing um, painting that was shot hundreds of years or painted hundreds of years ago. But the guy looks like he's from the Northeast in Philly. I mean, he, he really looks like a, a Philadelphian. He's got the, the Philly beard. I don't know about the top part of the haircut. We like fades uh, up in the Northwest. Nonetheless, this brother looks like he just got off of the XH, the 23, the C bus, one of them. And even his, his adornment looks like a hoodie from 52nd Street. So in the internet doing what they do, here, here's what they put together. Billy Penn tweeted, this 15th century Carthusian monk looks exactly like a dude from North Philly. In fact, they took his head and put it on top of a guy walking in outside of a Wawa. Then let's take another look. AC Jr. tweeted, coming soon to the Philadelphia Museum of Art, the Philly monk. Yes, he has his own hashtag, patron saint, wearing a Philadelphia hat. I don't know about uh, the cigarette piece. We don't do that here. However, nonetheless, uh, this monk has made the rounds. And I want to give a shout out to, to uh, Colt Shaw and his, um, his, his efforts to give us a good laugh. Colt, your work has gone around the world. We thank you for making us laugh uh, going out of 2020, hopefully into a more prosperous 2021. Now, this next guest dr asia johnson her her teaching career started 15 years ago right here in philadelphia so philly stand up she's one of yours she just recently uh, received her doctorate in education management at drexel university she also holds uh, a ed in educational leadership for change from bank street college 
and an MED in special education from Holy Family University. If that's not enough, there's a BA in English from an HBCU, Dell State, stand up. She's one of yours as well. She's currently the principal of Longwood Preparatory Academy in the South Bronx after holding uh, several positions at a charter school in, in Harlem, including principal uh, Dr. Johnson also served as the director of special education programs for the New York City Department of Education's District 79, where she assisted with the creation of special education instruction for incarcerated youth and secured detention on Rikers Island. That in itself is a tremendous work, a tremendous responsibility, and we're thankful for her work. And so I welcome none other than Dr. Asia Johnson to Heart City. Welcome home. It's such a pleasure having you on with us. Thank you. Thank you so much for having me. So, Doc, you're doing amazing work. Many are dealing with challenges of education at home, let alone dealing with incarcerated youth, making sure that they have quality education, that we're able to break uh, a lot of these chains that have been coupled on our youth when they enter the system how did this become your passion? What made you say with all of this expertise, all of this, uh, you know, opportunity, I'm going to channel it to our, one of our most vulnerable populations. Yeah. So I grew up in poverty. So I'm from North Philly. I'm not just like, yeah. <laughs> I'm not an uptown girl. Um, I although I did to lie and say that I was from West Oak Lane because all of my family is from West there Oak Lane. <laughs> But, um, and I hung, up, uh, hung out a lot in West Oak Lane. Actually, I graduated from Germantown High School. So uh, now, now I understand. I'm a Germantown bear as well. There you okay. go. Bear country is in the building. Yes, yes. <laughs> um, and so I spent a lot of my time um, at, at, at a younger age, um, my early, early years, um, probably I guess until I was about seven years old, I lived in like some harsh poverties. Um, I lived in shelters and bounced around a couple schools. You know, my, my, my mother, who's, she's deceased now, but um, had a lot of, you know, some, some trouble. And it, it caused a lot of pain as a young person that I still remember till this day. Um, and, you know, I had a lot of aunts and um, I had my father, I had a, um, a stepmother who took me under her wing at 10 and just like treated me like I was her own and develop me into the person that I am today along with my father. And so I think what ended up happening to me was that because I had experienced that at such a young age, um, I knew that I couldn't allow for other kids to have, even if they that was their experience, I might not be able to change that for them, but at least I can give them a, a, a sense of hope. And I think that's always what I wanted. I wanted kids to feel that they can they can get out of poverty and they can be determined to do whatever they want to do in their life, regardless of how they started. You know, um, I have worked with District 79. That was years ago before I became a principal. But I knew that I could work in the South Bronx. I know people are like, if you can make it in New York, if you can make it here, you can make it anywhere. And I think the Bronx, the South Bronx especially, right. is it is number one mm -hmm. research like it is actually the poorest congressional district in the nation what people don't highlight enough they're just like oh the bronx is poor but it's actually the poorest in the nation and some of the challenges is that it reminds me so much of north philly of like there's a house here there's a abandoned building here or it's just like the forgotten place um and our kids and my my kids and my school they needed so much even as high school students and so I decided that I was just going to do whatever I could possibly do in my power to make sure that they didn't go without whatever that meant. Um, you know, I just had to do it. You know, what's interesting. My mother is a 33 year teacher. She's retired. She always wanted me to get into education. And I, after going to Germantown, I was like, uh, no, I'll pass and I'll go into the corporate space. I, and I think it takes someone who has a unique heart for our community and for our children to go into education uh, because you deal with so much. It's not just partnering with the principal who, who's you know the building lead, but it's dealing with children who may have IEPs, you know, TSS, MTs and BSC workers. You, you, you teach a child and after that eight hour experience, they go home and have it literally reprogrammed 
by their environment and you have to start all over. I mean, there's so much that a teacher has to endure from from an instructor's heart and, and really from an admin's heart because you're, you're in that space now. What are some of the things that you want parents to know about your experience on the other side of your of children's uh, education that that might be missing from the conversation. I think a lot of times we get into the numbers, but we don't get into the nuance. We don't talk about the heartstrings that really matter and drive the issue home. Yeah, I talk all this time to my husband about this um, fact of like normalizing poverty. Okay. Uh, part of this really comes from this sense of like, you know, parents not being honest when they're poor and being honest with their kids about this is not what you want for yourself. This, this is my life. This is what I've had to experience. This is what I've had to endure. But this doesn't mean that this is what needs to happen to you. And, and really instilling that the, the, your only way out is through education, right? Like I want you to right. go hard. I want you to work as hard as you possibly can. I don't want you to worry about, you know, food on the table or, or having the nice things or things, those things will come, but really trying to get parents to instill that. I think sometimes, um, especially, I mean, I'm black, so I, I'm speaking specifically about some of my people and the things that I've experienced and not to say that this is everyone's experience, but sometimes in our families, what we tend to do is we're not honest with our kids about the fact that we have struggled and that we're currently struggling. We don't want them to be like us. Wow. And so I think, having been raised by my dad, he was very, he didn't play, you know, they say dads don't play. He was really like, no, you're going to college. I was like, I don't want to do that. You're going. Like, you you don't, he had no idea how, he, he never wanted to mention, you know, payments. He didn't mention a scholarship. Okay. He never told me to get all A's and B's, but he said, you know, you're going to go to college. And I think what I want our parents to know, especially, is that your child can be more, can be that person that you imagine them to be, right? Mm. That, that that connection that you have in elementary school where you're taking them every day and you're having conversations about their day, somehow that starts to like fade away when they get into middle school and high school and then you stop talking. And so I've always asked parents like, you know, please don't be those graduation registration and graduation parents, right? I only see you at registration and I don't see you again at graduation. I cannot do this without you for the next four years. I know he can get on the train by himself he can do everything by himself he could probably run the whole house without you yeah. but i still need you in this education process i can't do this without you so help me to help your child be able to graduate and go to college and like you know follow this plan and i think most parents that have been when they they see me that I, I i always believe in this this thing of trust parents have to trust you if mm -hmm. they're thinking full of crap that's it you've lost them Right. Um, but the minute you can see them that I am just like your child when I meet with kids, they come into my office and the parents, I talk, I have the parents there as just like, look, we're here together, but I'm going to talk directly to your child because they're the ones that I have the most influence over because I see them more. And I think parents respect that as well as being able to just speak one on one about what is it that you're going to do? How can I help you? What is missing from what's happening right here in this educational setting that I can support you with? And I found that as a leader to be the most um, successful thing that I've been able to do so far. You talked about communities of color and their challenges that exist in the space. Obviously, yes, you are black. So you you know these experiences from a personal level. How important is it for us to have faces that resemble our students in the classroom? I know that's a big conversation, but it largely happens kind of like once a year, it kind of bubbles up where we say we need black educators uh just last year we started talking about we need more black male educators but what's the impact of having that is it is it just enough to have a great teacher or is it critical and crucial for our community in terms of closing this educational gap this wealth gap to have teachers that that come from the community that look like us you know and essentially are us it's extremely important. I mean, it, there's no doubt that, um, you know, education, teaching is a white teaching for a work workforce right. predominantly um, ran, you know, like teachers are predominantly white in this force. But I think that the challenges is when you have children, especially those that come from poverty, they have to see people who look like them. So they have something to aspire to. Mm -hmm. um, I was talking to the, the borough president of um, the Bronx who came by, um, 
last week when we had an event, uh, like, you know, we were giving out Christmas gifts or whatever to our children. And, and, and I was, I wasn't dressed like, you know, like it, it was a business. I was dressed. I knew I was going to be on my feet all day. So I had on a pair of Yeezys and like a school hoodie, which is like kind of cool. And so now he like knows me as like the principal who wears the Yeezys, right? And he's like, principals wear Yeezys? And I said, and I'm trying to help him understand that kids have to see a lot of themselves mm -hmm. within within you, right? As a leader, um, you, because if they see someone who's always stuck up, now mind you, I wear dresses and things of that nature, but I have to culturally identify with the things that I know my scholars are also into. And if I don't, then they won't see that there's a connection between me and them. They will see like, oh, well, you know, you grew up with a silver spoon in your mouth or you don't know. And or kids will say I'm with high school kids. So if I talk like them, they'll say, oh, Miss Johnson, I'm, I'm trying to be, you know, and this is New York and this is not Philly. Right. I could use a Philly accent, too, because I'm still a young guy. <laughs> there you go. But my, you know, my New York, my, my, my um, New Yorkers will be like, you know, will say, um, you know, Dr. Johnson, I'm trying to be like you. What's up, B? I'm trying to get money like you. And I'm said, I got four degrees. <laughs> uh -huh. <laughs> be like me, you got to go to college. And I'm not telling them, you know, like they, if you see something that I like that you that you're interested in, listen, a college degree got me here. Right. It's not my drug dealing boyfriend, or I came mm -hmm. up on, you know, on a lick or any of those things. It is literally that I worked hard to get there. And I'm like, see, this is why I'm telling you why you need to go to this college class that's that's offered off campus, right? This is why I want you to become, get into this fast track college program. This is why I want you to pay attention in this class when they're talking about X, because if we're teaching financial literacy, you need to be involved in those things because that is how you're going to be able to afford the Yeezys and the Balenciagas and all of these other nice things that you like. But kids it's important when they see someone that's the same race as them that they can identify that with them without thinking that you only got here because somebody helped you to get here financially or that you grew up differently. I'm no different than you. I grew up the same as you. And in some cases, probably even worse than you. I, I know what it's like to live in a shelter when it's time to eat, it's time to eat. I, I know what it's like to be involved with a, you know, mm -hmm. it, call it DHS in Philly, but it's ACS in New York. I know that what those things are like. And I think as much as you can help kids to understand that I'm no different from you, not to say that you have to go through the same, you know, financial experiences um, as you are, but you have to identify with the culture. That is so important for kids of color. So your first mandate to us as parents, continue to have the conversation. Don't allow that disengaging that occurs around that teen year to become a permanent fixture. That is absolutely crucial. The second thing was, you know, it, it was almost a plea from from your side to ours. Come to the meetings. Home and school matters and, and beyond. Right. So it's not just coming to those meetings, but staying in touch with your teacher uh, or your child's teacher, understanding that it's a partnership. It truly is. The The third thing that you gave us was communities of color need to see faces of color, especially in the areas of, of education. Um, and so it's, it's really crucial for those who are looking at professions, thinking about changing professions to bring that expertise into the instructional space and in, in an industry and, and begin to balance this industry appropriately. As we kind of close this interview, Doc, there are so many organizations that want to get involved, but they don't know how, you know, mentorship organizations, fraternal organizations, uh, sororities that, that are saying, look, I, I want to get engaged, but it, I want to I want to go beyond the book bag drive. I want to go beyond the haircuts, which are great. We want our kids looking good, feeling good and all those things. But I want to do more from your side as a building administrator, understanding what can and, and can't happen in the process. What are the things that we should look for as organizations in getting involved in some of our partnership opportunities with education? You definitely want to look for schools that are 100% in need. I do find that there are some schools that have <clears throat> either no financial need or little financial need, um, but have an interest. And a lot of organizations, surprisingly, like to work with schools that already have um, a major backing, especially schools that have like larger PTA budgets for okay. some reason. And I'm speaking um, specifically, I know that there's some schools in Manhattan that have like huge partnerships. I, I have a, a son who graduated from a school in Manhattan 
and I would get listservs of all the opportunities that, you know, that they, the, those kids could get. And I was in the Bronx and some of those opportunities actually were in the Bronx. And I'm like, wow. I don't understand how this is going to kids that are in a school downtown Manhattan and wow. I'm right here in the Bronx and I've never got any of this information. And so I, I think the things that what ends up happening is that those opportunities and when they talk about the opportunity gap, it does exist. And it specifically exists in poor communities and communities of color. Well, with any organization that wants to get involved, they really need to do some digging and some and trying to understand what is the mission of that school, understanding who the leader is and what they have done so far and what they're trying to accomplish in their in their mission and vision for the school. Also, I mean, financially, it's obvious um, as well. I think what ends up happening a lot of times, too, is that um, organizations look at the data, the academic data of the uh, schools and say, I don't want any parts of that because the data says this is a low performing school. But a lot of times it's a low performing school because of the lack of finances that exist in the school. So, uh, yes, of course, I can't afford to give my kids all of the tutoring and the resources and things of that nature. So yes, the academic performance might be an issue because I can't afford those things. That's why I need you. And so mm -hmm. I think the more organizations start looking closely at the data saying, hey, I noticed that your kids are underperforming some of the other children that's in this district or in this school, uh, in the school system. How can I be of service? How can I help? Um, I think those other programs, the sororities and the fraternities definitely doing more mentorships, the uh, above the big brother and big sister of like, mm -hmm. hey, I'm gonna come in one day, take some photo ops and leave of like, how can I really get involved in this community and be a figure when I walk into this door that people remember me and it's not just today I'm here, I took a photo op and I say, that's the school I'm with and then I don't see you again until next year. Like that's not community service to me. It's just like, I'm doing this because I have to fulfill a certain number of community service hours or something. Right. So, broadcast audience understand uh, Dr. Johnson is saying the, the photo ops aren't needed at this moment. And yes, we honor the haircuts and the book bags and all those things, but get engaged and find out what the true need is. More importantly, look for schools that actually have 100% need. Not that others would not appreciate your effort. Uh, but it's really crucial that we get to the schools that don't make the media list, that they're not showing up with the camera for the first day of school. Those are the schools that really need the voice, need the impact, need the support, need the mentorship, uh, and need the resources that we all bring to bear. Doc, you're amazing. Uh, you, you gave us some, some really crucial information, and I think that it's information we can take and, and really digest, but really provide impact in this year we have a new administration so we're excited that there will be a first lady who's focused on education and so uh we hope that you know our education efforts from the federal level really are able to trickle down into effective state budgets across uh the country but more importantly that we have administrators like you in the space who are going to make sure that a climate and culture of success exists and so for that we honor you we love you and appreciate the work that you're doing for our community. Know that this is home for you. So whatever you need, however we can be supportive, let us know and we'll be there. Thank you. I appreciate your time. Thank you so much. Thank you. And so we've heard uh, from Dr. Johnson who broke down literally, I mean, honestly, it, the need from instructors telling you straight up, I, I need you here. I need you present. It's not just about you know, donating here and there. It's not just about the book bags and the haircuts, but I need you present throughout the child's whole process. The other component, making sure that as a parent, that we're not just looking at the administration and the building as uh, essentially a daycare, but making sure that we're communicating with the guidance counselors, making sure that we're communicating with the instructors to know what our children are doing, uh, where their gaps are, how we can support them and get them ahead. If you are a fraternity, sorority, or organization that wants to give back through corporate social responsibility, uh, do so with schools that really need it. It's beyond just what your PR person can get and how sexy that can look on frame and the IG lives that you can do from this pretty school. Sometimes we have to get uh, into some of the most um, opportunity-focused schools 
to ensure that we can get them what they need and get to the next level. Because if we're doing service, we need to truly serve those in need, not serve ourselves. Um, lastly, make sure that as a, a, a whole, we're paying attention to education in the legislative landscape. I think that's really crucial, knowing what legislation is going to be proposed, knowing how to support it, talk about it at the state level, talk about it at the local level, ensure that they are in uh, a cohesive effort to ensure that the funding stream happens because it's, it's nothing more disheartening to have federal funds come down or resources be allocated and it go into a black hole and never ever see the schools and the children who really need the help. In order to do that, we have to keep everyone who is elected on their toes and let them know that our children and their education is paramount. Dr. Johnson, we're gonna make sure that we post uh, all of the articles about her work and the ways that you can help her in the Bronx on our social media pages, please. If you're in the area or if you are impassioned by what she has said today, get involved and get involved in your local footprint as well. Our next guest, this brother, I am floored by him. We talked about him in our pre-production meetings this week. This guy said, look, I need, I need some assistance. I'm a photographer. I do well in the space already. I'm, I'm, I'm trying to make it happen. I know how to do what I do and because I do it well, but I need more support. If you could just retweet, if you could just push this message out, I'd be forever grateful. And you know, tweet really doesn't cost anything, right? All you gotta do is click the retweet button and it happens. Well, guess what? Thousands retweeted his post and special somebody saw that tweet and decided that she will respond. And she responded in a major way. This brother, Malcolm Manning, photographer extraordinaire, man. Welcome to Heart City. It's great having you with us, bro. Just uh, take your take your mic off mute if you can. Yeah. Hey, man. Thanks for having me. I'm so yeah. glad to be here. I appreciate it. Um, the invite onto the show. Dude, you broke the internet, man. Like you tweeted <laughs> out, I need some support. I, I, I'm nice with these lens. I just need some support. And a special somebody retweeted you back. Who was that person? Yeah, it was amazing, man. Um, so Oprah Winfrey actually uh, went on and retweeted my work and it's just been an amazing and humbling experience um, since then. Um, it's crazy because the night that it happened, um, I actually have put the tweet out. It had been up for several days and it did pretty well. And a lot of people were retweeting, which I was, I was satisfied with that. You know, I had no expectations with the tweet. Um, I was just putting my work out there and just seeing what it would do. So I had no idea. And so I was satisfied with, you know, the feedback and the engagement that I had already gotten. I've got a couple thousand retweets and a couple thousand likes. And um, as I'm wrapping up a photo shoot, uh, it was Sunday night. I won't forget this. <laughs> I'm wrapping up a photo shoot and I'm walking the client out and my phone is just going off crazy in my pocket. And um, I just feel vibrations. I'm ding, ding, ding. And I'm like, it's a Sunday night, you know, yeah, what's up? A photo shoot. I'm about to go home and chill. Right. Are you me? Who is messaging me right now? What is going on? Yeah. Um. So I pull my phone out to see what's going on. Why is it buzzing off so much? And um, it wasn't Oprah's tweet. wasn't even the first tweet I had saw. Actually, it was someone who quoted um my tweet and said, "Um, hello, Oprah's reaching out. You need to respond." And I'm just looking like, what are they talking about? Like, yeah, yeah. yeah. Oprah's reaching out. Like, what? So I'm scrolling down, I'm seeing so many congratulations, congratulations, oh my God, this is a blessing. And I'm just so confused as to what they're talking about. And then I finally get to the tweet um, that Oprah uh, quoted and said that she wanted me to come out and uh, work on a project with her. And um, it, it, at first it didn't even hit me. Like I didn't even realize what was going on. So I'm like, what? Mm -hmm. This can't be real. Like that's my immediate reaction is this can't right. be real. 
And then it wasn't until I clicked on her page and I saw the verified check along with the 43.5 million followers. And I'm just like, oh, wow, this is the real deal. Dude, it's so crazy because you made me want to get back on Twitter because I'm like, <laughs> you know, so I'm the IG Facebook guy, which probably means I'm a little bit older than you. But, you know, we're going to leave that for part <laughs> of the conversation. And so, you know, it, it's apparent that these social media platforms can be used to really benefit your profession. Um, but there's a deeper story, in my opinion, with you because you were qualified and prepared to handle the blessing you were given. And so many times, you know, people, we ask for the help. We're like, listen, if Jay-Z would just hear my 16 bars, yo, I'm ready for the tour. No, you're not. Like, you're not practicing. You're not focused on, on you know, whether or not I'm going to drop an album or just a single. I, I don't have a plan. You had a plan. And so talk to the broadcast audience about why it's so important to be prepared for the blessings we're asking for. Yeah, so to speak to that, I think honestly, um, you can't, when you go into something, you have to go into it with your heart. You know, if, mm. you're not, if you're not going into it with your heart and you're not passionate about what you're doing, then I think your work will reflect that, you know? Wow. And um, I'm very passionate and I love what I do and it makes it easy for me. Uh, to put in those long hours and to put in that practice to get to where I am today. Just because it doesn't feel like practice or it doesn't feel like long hours. It just feels like I'm just doing what I love to do. I'm doing you know, what I love to do. Yeah, I, I played basketball growing up. So it, it just feels like I'm in the gym working on my free throw, you know? Yeah. I'm just, I'm, I spent hours um, at home um, just, just practicing and working on my skills and honing in and I feel like with every photo shoot that I've done, um, I got better in some aspect and in some way. So to relate back to your question, like, you know, just being prepared, I think that it just ties in with just practicing, like just practice as much as you can. You're not practicing for any uh, riches. You're not practicing for any fame. You know what I'm saying? Like when I'm taking pictures, I'm like, oh, I'm not trying to go viral. This isn't, that's not why I'm doing it. Yeah. And I'm doing it because my heart's in it. And I'm passionate about it. And I feel like that has led me to be prepared for any other opportunities that come with it. And I think my, my passion speaks through my work. And I felt like, I feel like that's what makes me prepared. You know, it's just right. it's something I'm doing with passion and love, you know? So now let's talk about these opportunities for those who are watching right now, who went to, to the Twitter account, saw everything that's popping right now, went to your website, went to your IG and said, this guy is the truth. I know I was talking with um, an, an amazing artist right here in uh, Philly just yesterday, Wendy Freeman from Painting Pretty. And she was looking at some of the work that you were doing. And she said, look, this dude is hot. Like, I love this photo. And so now the world knows your name, knows your work. How does one get in touch with you, get on your schedule, which I'm sure is uh, quickly filling up? <laughs> yeah, um, it has definitely been an influx of business um, since the retweet, um, and I feel like I'm managing it as best as I can. If anyone was looking to get in contact with me, um, you know, I check my DMs, uh, mm -hmm. whether it be Twitter, Instagram, Facebook. I check it every day, um, at probably once in the morning and then once at night before I go to sleep. Um, and then my website, you know, just using my link, that's the best way. Uh, it helps me to keep everything organized in one place. Uh, just using the link in my website. And, you know, um, the way I have it set up is you put your name, uh, the services that you're looking for, um, and the date. You can talk about any ideas you want. And then you send that over to me. Um, and I also ask to include like a handle, like a Twitter handle or Instagram handle, just so I can put a face and know who I'm talking to. Yeah. Um, and then, um, yeah, we'll put a project. I'll see what I can do, um, and how I can help that project come to life and, um, we'll make it happen. Dude, I, I believe that the creator has something amazing for you. It's not just about Oprah, uh, but about your preparedness. You yeah, know, man, thank you. I really do appreciate that. Yeah, man. And so we're going to do our part as well. We're going to make sure that we continuously promote uh, your work and, and what you're doing in the space on our social media platforms. Uh, but I, I have quite a feeling that in the near future, you're going to need an, a, an assistant 
<laughs> more than the, the one in the morning, one in the evening response, brother. You, your work is going to go far and wide, man. So we love you. We honor you. Thank you for keeping the culture uh, at, at the, the highest, highest of positions, man, not just through your work, but through your efforts uh, to be a better man, a better business person um, and to, to represent the craft. No, thank you. I thank you for even, you know, seeing something in my work. And I thank you for acknowledging and uh, appreciating my work and all the assistance that you you offer to me. I really do uh, appreciate it. Uh, I think what people fail to realize is that the love and support, it means so much to what we do as creators, you know, mm -hmm. not just photographers or artists in any way. The support, it means the most. It helps us to stay motivated. You know, sometimes we may fall off track and sometimes we may, you know, lose uh, focus or the vision, but through love and support of just family and friends and now uh, strangers even, it just, it just means a lot to, to us. So thank you. I really do appreciate it from my heart. Hey, listen, we appreciate you, my brother. Give our love to the family and we'll be in touch soon. All right. Sounds good. Thank you. So you've heard from our brother, Malcolm Manning, uh, amazing artist his skill set, uh, I, I need you to go. And don't take my word for it. I'm like LeVar Burton with Reading Rainbow, right? Don't take my word for it. Go to his site, follow him and support him. Check out the work, retweet him. If you want to catch the wave of Oprah, then retweet that one if, if that's you know your mission. But more importantly, keep getting his name out there. And then I want you to know this, his story is representative of what's possible with all of us. So don't be so cool that you can only retweet Malcolm's tweet because Oprah tweeted it, but not tweet your own people's work. That one you might get on the ride home. So how can we be friends? How can we care about our folk, but not ever retweet them, not ever support them with a click, a like, a love? You just never know where that goes uh, but if we truly care about each other and we're serious about this whole greenwood concept right it's not just killer mike and everybody else but if if we're serious about fourth avenue and rosewood and making sure that our businesses are successful the first thing and probably most easiest thing that we can do is to support businesses like malcolm and make sure that we retweet repost and more importantly book with them uh, or purchase from them, whatever their services or products may be. I'm excited about his future. And I'm also excited about our future in black businesses. So I'm, I'm going to our next uh, segment, the EKG segment. I'm excited about these two. Uh, we've had them here before. I'm glad to have them back again. They're going to end 2020 with us. None other than <laughs> Reverend Dwayne Watts and Delia McLaughlin. It is always good to have both of you on Heart City. Welcome back home. Thank you for uh, the invite. It was good to be back in the living room. Hey, listen, <laughs> in the living room, indeed. We might have to, whenever you come, we're going to turn it over to the living room. It's now the living room, Delia. How are you, Delia? It's great having you. I'm good. I'm trying to get you know my camera together, but it's good I, to see you. It's good to see you. How has 2020 treated you guys outside of the obvious? You made it through. I'm yeah. here, so that's half the battle. That's all that matters. That is indeed half the battle. We have so much to talk about. Are you guys ready for the EKGs? Let's get it. Oh, let's get it indeed. Here we go. This is the EKG, the part of the show where we place America front and center on the monitors of the American people. We will look for irregularities in the heartbeat, offer solutions on the issues we find in order to make America healthy once again. So fire up the machine. Let's start the EKG. And so this week's EKGs are brought to you by Deshuri CBD products, minority owned and operated. Make sure you check them out at my Deshuri, D-A-S-H-U-R-I.com. Our first story, you guys are going to love this one. X. NBA player, Junior Bridgman, buys the bankrupt Ab Ebony magazine for $14 million. Now, his company, Bridgman Sports and Media, has become the new owner of Ebony after a successful bid to purchase 
the bankrupt media firm for 14 million dollars now we all know ebony was founded in 1945 by john johnson and the magazine enjoyed wide readership before dropping ad revenues and quite frankly the internet and so according to a wall street journal article the bankruptcy judge was expected to approve the deal yesterday and that approval was in place as of this morning and so obviously the magazine went through chapter seven um in july they defaulted on about 10 million dollars however uh the bankruptcy was converted into a voluntary chapter 11 reorganization what's most amazing about this story the continuation of black legacy will happen in the space i mean it's, it, and it's great to see a guy who most probably have not even paid attention to i mean if, if you think about somebody going to purchase ebony magazine right somebody would have said okay well magic johnson or i don't know mike jordan or lebron and then here comes somebody that most don't even know they're like junior bridgman who in the world is that and where did he come from with this level of money it goes to show that um we should never judge a book by their cover we should never think that if you are that only the superstar athletes they're the only ones that can make moves like this we all have an opportunity delia when you see this article when you see this kind of opportunity and continuation of black excellence what are your thoughts what runs through your mind um, I get chills, I think, and it's inspiring. That tells me that maybe one day I can, you know, yeah, the same thing. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I, so, so Dwayne, um, $14 million. I'm, I'm about $13,999,000 <laughs> short of that 14, but I, I, I get the swag. I, I know, you know, what's possible sometimes our businesses need new blood they need new investments they need uh to be to be reignited you know that that passion that flame that got them to this point it looks like ebony is going to receive that in junior and his uh work what were your thoughts when you saw this article and the opportunities actually when i saw the article first time it was yesterday uh mm -hmm. and i immediately thought about this the fourth principle of Kwanzaa, which was yesterday, which was Ujamaa, Cooperative Economics. Yeah. And what I'm looking at here is how he's moving forward in a space to actually preserve history for our people of our kind, right? What I mean specifically is that we are huge on images and throughout the years, that magazine has represented our people and the imagery that is portrayed. And he's preserving, yes, uh, it's a magazine, but it's much more behind it. There's history, there's legacy. So mm -hmm. when I first thought of it, I, I immediately thought of, you know, granted he's representing uh, his brand and his business and he's obviously built an empire, but what mm -hmm. he's also done is far reaching beyond generations to come and generations past. Yes, indeed. Um, and so broadcast audience, this is a larger scale version of what's possible, but there are things that we can do locally, right? So when we talk about businesses on commercial corridors and, and their needs, making sure that they have uh, investments, we may see our favorite deli that's black owned or our favorite barbershop. There are ways for us to invest locally into local businesses, give them uh, re-energized effort uh, and ensure that they're able to, to withstand some of the impact of COVID and just the changes that exist. And so, we're going to make sure that we post that article, please, by all means, retweet it and have conversations with your black business group on Clubhouse or whatever your new uh, <laughs> platform may be. Let's go to our next EKG. I mean, this one is right there in the same vein. So Master P says, look, I'm, I'm serious about buying up the block. And Baron Davis said, I'm I'm right there with you. And so, yeah, we can buy the block. We can buy wrap snacks. We can buy, you know, whatever, oodles and noodles. <laughs> but this whole concept of Reebok, 
because we love some footwear. And so let's not just create our own sneaker. Let's buy one of the biggest brands in sports today. It is confirmed uh, that there are discussions beginning around Reebok. So I, I don't need y'all to go and say, all right, well, Master P, they already purchased it. No, it's just the beginning of discussion around a purchase of Reebok. Dwayne, I mean, look, yeah. it's Reebok, bro. Yeah. Reebok. Yeah. I mean, that's a major, major, major acquisition. And it's not just footwear. It's all of their businesses, which include uh, the various industries that they focus on, um, the the sporting equipment, and also what's possible, the, the future technological advancements that they're already working on. I Black think that's, experts, bro. yeah, I think that's, again, another example of economics coming together co collectively, because obviously there's Master P and Baron Davis, but I also look specifically at Reebok and what it's had, it has meant, like, to mm -hmm. our culture over the years because the biggest one on the Reebok roster was Allen Iverson. Indeed. Who carried that brand for years. Indeed. And, you know, with the exit of Allen Iverson, so did some of the popularity of Reebok. But for this to kind of come full circle yeah. and where it can truly be a brand that's represented by the people uh, and and controlled by the people, of, I, I think it's a phenomenal move. I think it's a phenomenal move. Delia, let me ask you a question. Are you are you a Reebok fan now? Um, well, yeah. I, mean, I think back when I, I used to wear um what do they call it? New York 32 something. They were freestyle for me. I wore mm -hmm. a high top freestyle. Um oh, but when I saw this, I was, you know, I really it excited me as an extra, yeah. gener you know, generation extra. Um People in my generation are doing major things, right? major, right? And a child of hip hop to see, you know, folks, because that's a culture. This is me. This is a representation of, you know, the almost 41 years of my life. And I'm like, wow, you know, you yeah. see people like Earl Graves or, you know, Johnson family. That's not my generation. But I'm proud to say that these are black folks that, you know, are paved the way for stuff like this, but you know, for something that a person that's part of my generation spoke my language, it's mm -hmm. major. Listen, uh, Master P started off with no limit, and nobody understood it back then. I, I think they get it now, <laughs> where yeah. what time he was on and the possibilities that exist. And so, shout out to Master P and Baron Davis for uh, the great work that they are doing. This story here blew my mind. I, I could not wrap my head around this. It took me about a day or two to kind of figure out, you know, where they're going. And I think the government has some merit to it, but it's a challenge nonetheless. Uh, mm -hmm. So uh, this one here. Uh, after the permit was approved for a whites only church, a small Minnesota town insists that it is not racist. NBC News is reporting this. Now, the city leaders uh, are basically saying, look, if we turned down a Satru folk mm -hmm. assembly, we would have faced an amazingly expensive legal battle. This is happening right in Murdoch, Minnesota. Um, and they granted a conditional use permit to open the church there and practice its pre-Christian religion that originated in northern europe that's a whole another component to this uh now opponents to this measure have collected fifty thousand signatures to stop this all-white church from making its home in the farming town of 280 people delia look i think this is some of what comes when we talk about leveling the playing field and we talk about equity in some of these conversations, we always know that the pendulum shifts. So if we swing it all the way one side, we create enough momentum for it to come back the other side. I think this is one of those cases by which uh, church is saying, look, y'all talk about black lives matter. Well, you know, white lives matter and we're going to 
if you can single out black folk, then we can single out some white folk. And we just want to worship by ourselves. And we want our own band, our own praise and worship leader. <laughs> and that's, and that's that. Uh, I mean, this is what comes with some of this space. And so when we say we want legislators to just have a heavy hand and just say, black people now come up, that's it. That that's the legislation. We forget what we open up as a precedent on the other side. Do you feel like this is one of those cases, Delhi? No, I think it's BS. I think it's a slide of hand. <laughs> it, um, yeah. You can act I mean, we talk about you know apples and oranges. They're both fruit, but it's not the same thing. Yeah. Right. So um, maybe I, you know, we're gonna come, someone come out and say, you know, I have ancestry in Europe, and I want to come and worship some Norse gods too. Mm -hmm. because yeah. this country is basically built on equity and equality so it's not just so i had to have white skin in order to say i'm from europe uh, yes so um so rev uh <laughs> held no punches <laughs> and made it clear uh, y'all are all the way off base i mean even as we look at our comments uh, Sonia Sessom says, look, my God, that's not even biblical. I, I, and, I, mean, so and I think, I think that's exactly the point, right? Mm -hmm. Number one, my, my perspective is going to be a little bit different. I'm going to I'm just preface yeah. that by saying that everything is not necessarily what God wants us to be a part of. Yeah. We need to accept that, right? Agreed. Secondly, just because they're labeled a church, the question is, what are they teaching in that church? And if you I do so further discovery you'll find you don't want to be a part of that anyway no now that's just my take now to a further extent by the law of the land they have certain advantages and freedoms that can be extended to them regardless mm -hmm. of where they stand as a faith-based organization mm -hmm. they have the same eligibilities the same rights yeah the same uh access and protocols but let's think about this specifically we also realize that many that westernized Christianity has subscribed to a whitewashed westernized culture. Indeed. So the Christianity or the gospel that they may be teaching or way me that they may be practicing is not necessarily the gospel of the Bible. That's not the gospel of our God, right? So we need to be able to kind of take a meta view and examine well, what exactly is their stance? Is it something that we need to be part of? Because we all can say that in, as, as a blanket statement, everything that's open to us is not a door that we necessarily are supposed to walk through. Wow, that that is big. That is big. And I think, you know, look, um, we have been more welcoming to other races as it relates to worship. Mm -hmm. I, I mean, if, if we're going to be honest, even when we talk about the massacre that occurred, you know, in Charleston, when, when we talk, I, it, there wasn't a, mm -hmm. mm, I don't know if this white guy should come in the church. Uh, we're always, uh, come on in, especially if it's, you know, dare I say it, and I know I'm going to get some women's ministries on my heels, but Lord knows if we are cooking in the church and there's some extra pieces of chicken, some greens and some church punch, we are down to give you some, mm -hmm. especially if you subscribe to the 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 belief and practices that we have as it relates to our religion and the god we serve uh it, it's really unique how this war is coming down to separatism across all kinds of fronts and now in the religious front we already know that there was an evangelical challenge that existed in the political space we'll probably see more of this as the days go on and so this is one to pay attention to uh but as delia said it's bs <laughs> she yep. said there's no need for a sermon on it i'm calling it what it is uh and so please share that article um pay attention to it but more importantly don't stop the love if there's one who is of a different race culture creed than you uh but desires to serve god in the same manner that you do keep those doors open now is not the time for us to be retaliatory in any way uh shape or form let's go to our last story of the day this one is pretty interesting uh this video has made its rounds around the world quite frankly um, this woman decides 
that a well-known jazz musician, Kenyon Harold, his his son, 14 years old, is responsible for stealing her phone in New York City. Now, I, I don't even want to keep this picture up because she she just she drives me crazy. Let's kill the picture. I first of all, she left the phone in an Uber. Like, I, I mean, my God, I, you were irresponsible. You didn't see this kid snatch your phone or any of these. There's no indication that what he's carrying belongs to you. But yet you decide because he's 14 years old, he's black. This would be a great narrative for me to run with. And because management happens to be the same skin color, I'm just going to push this agenda. And so thankfully it was recorded, you know, and I hate to say this, but thankfully it was a child of, of one who has some notoriety. So this could travel. Um, because many of these cases go under wraps, right? And and now we're talking yet again uh, about all the things you can't do while black. Apparently being 14 years old in New York City hotels is another thing that is under uh, scrutiny if you are black. Thankfully, the child was not harmed. It was not arrested or any of these kind of, of uh, challenges to his life, but Rev, here we are again. I mean, here we are again. Uh, when will this stop or will it never stop? And is this just the new normal that has been created in these recent in events in our world? Yeah. I, it, the short answer is as long as there is the existence of prejudice that it, sten that it stems from the, the, uh, the white supremacist lens where black skin is always a threat, mm. or always guilty, we will have this type of problem. Wow, and it's unfortunate. It's unfortunate because really, uh, what we're really talking about is a, is is a lack to see the humanity in another person. Yeah, and that because that person is always the person of color, so we refuse to see them as human. And this is a a, a black male child who, in one lens, and I saw an interview with a mom said, on one end, you know, he's viewed as a little boy, but he's yeah. at a stage where he's not viewed as a cute, kind young man anymore, or little boy. See, he's now viewed as a threat, and it depends on that lens that we're being viewed view from. So I think we do have to be able to speak the truth to power, but in this instance, she deserves to be uh, exposed to the point of repentance. That's my hope. Yeah. She should be exposed to the point of turning around, of having a contrite heart and realizing how uh, much full of error she has been, mm. so that there can now be change. and. That has to happen to some extent, but it's this is going to exist and it's sad. So Delia, mm -hmm. Christina Resick of Abilis said the trauma remains. Yeah. Worse is the encouragement management provided with these kind of accusations. Kim Smith said, look, no, 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 he was harmed. He is permanently traumatized. And quite frankly, she's absolutely right. We sometimes forget the PTSD. We're so used to it happening. We, we process it, we file it, put it away. It's just another incident. Thank God we didn't go to jail. Thank God we didn't end up in the hospital or dead. Nonetheless, there is trauma that exists. Delia, how do we handle this environment raising young kings and queens in such a, uh, a traumatic space? We model accountability, right? Um, I think the, um, it's important, and I think the father did this, made the, eight, um, the, the organization, the, the hotel responsible for this, but also um, the father being accountable for the aftermath of this child's feelings. Yeah. Um, I'm was traumatized reading the article. It's took me back. I was very triggered um, as a youth where I'm very light complexed. My mother is brown. And people always did not put her with me. And I would have to prove the, the validity of this woman being my mother. Um, and him having to do that, saying this is mine, and proving, and, and going back and forth. But the audacity of this woman approaching the child and not having a conversation with the parent. And the, uh, the hotel not stepping in and doing their right 
their responsibility in customer service. I worked in retail as a youth and we had the one person on one side, one on the other, like you do in school, you get, get the school. And um, uh, back to your point, the, you know, having a conversation with their child, um, knowing the, and ensuring him that he was correct in his behavior, that he was not going mm -hmm. to appeal to this woman. And, mm -hmm. and um, I wanted to check up on him, see how he was feeling, because it's something he's going to take with him through, through his entirety of his life. And he's um, going to see women that look like her or sound like her, and she's going to be triggered. And the father has to, you know, really encourage him and, and keep his feelings up. So it's interesting, um, Dr. Johnson, who just appeared on the show in our previous segment, said, look, this is an ongoing issue. People refuse to see black children, especially boys, for the age that they actually are. To your point, Rev, uh, earlier, she said, consider Tamir Rice. We know this to be true because uh, these officers were acquitted of their actions regarding Tamir Rice. He wasn't seen as a 12-year-old boy, but a threat. It's a challenge, nonetheless, a harsh reality that we have to teach our children how to back themselves away from potential situations like this. Mm -hmm. Knowing that we won't always be able to be there and, and have a camera phone, uh, show our support of them in proper manners. They may be in a position where all around them are individuals who believe they are threats. Mm -hmm. um, and and how, do, how do they handle that and, and navigate that? Unfortunately, that is now part of our mentorship uh, in our bat mitzvah uh, of sorts as we grow our folk into uh, young men and, and uh, beautiful queens. And so please, by all means, not only share this story, but have the conversations with the points that Delia and um, our brother, uh, Reverend Dwayne Watts brought up because I think it's so crucial that we have real talk with our young folk. I wish, I mean, around this age, all, all we were talking about was sports and whether or not, you know, whether or not we could get into college and what college we were looking at and what what our high school experience was going to be it's it's amazing that right now 14 year olds have to have conversations at the same level as a 30 35 40 year old man about how to navigate streets and, and these environments but i honor you delia and you reverend Dwayne watts for the work that you guys do is so crucial uh, to, to have leaders in our community who aren't worried about the spotlight, but they're worried about the substance. How do, how do we take care of our folk uh, for time to come? And so before we close this EKG, Delia, tell them how they can reach you, connect with you, uh, and, and, you know, take the next 30 seconds to tell us about a project or two you have coming up that we can be supportive of. Um, well, you know, as I said before, I'm a school administrator for the School District of Philadelphia. We provide uh, Parks intervention and, and trauma support to our students. Um, we work closely with the Uplift organizations who provide supports even during the school break. Yeah. Um, so I've been a school district directory. If you look me up, um, but I also provide. Um, uh, I'm a social worker by degree and by uh, profession, so I do therapy. So I'm moving through. Um, after race is moving through consulting. Um, at gmail.com. We'll make sure that we uh, post that information and continue to support your great work as well. It's so needed in the space. Reverend Dwayne Watts, brother, tell them how they connect with you uh, and vibe with the ministry and the movement that you have created. Well, sure. Um, I can be found on social media platforms at Dwayne Watts, D U A N E W A T T S. Um, but I'm also found at holytempleinc.org. That's our church, which is in the Fairmount uh, area of the city of Philadelphia. Uh, but I also, too, work for the city of Philadelphia as a middle school math teacher. So I, I left the world of finance and accounting to go into education uh, because of the very things that we've discussed on this very segment. Um, but I, I've also wanted just to say you can reach out and find us as well in the Peacock documentary called Black Boys, yeah. which speaks directly to this very same issue. I was part of that uh, initiative with Mr. Sharif L. Mekki on yeah. the Black Male Educators Initiative. So um, I can be found and reached in those areas. Listen, I'm excited about that uh, documentary. Shout out to Brother Sharif uh, and the great work that he did with that. Um, 
uh, and and Malcolm Jenkins too as well, and, and his his uh, production company and the great work that they did as well. Listen, I love you both. I honor you, respect the both of you. Uh, you already know this is home. Y'all want to come host the show? Yeah, just come <laughs> on in. Uh, you know, I'll sit on the other side. Uh, but I, I love you both, and I'm glad to to be able to spend this time with you. Not only happy holidays, but happy New Year to each one of you. By the time we talk again, we'll be on the other side. Yeah. Yeah. Well, bless New Year to you. Bless Christmas, and uh, the best to you. And I also want to say congratulations for your 2020. All right. Same to you. Same to you. We'll talk soon. So. You've heard from Daly McLaughlin and my brother, Reverend Dwayne Watts, on the great work that they are doing in the space. I'm excited about these two uh, next guests who are coming on the other side of our Black History Fact and Song of the Week, Taisha Brown and Vanessa Young, Power of Paint. You're going to hear about their program and the great work that they are doing in the space around arts, culture, uh, and education. I'm blending our Black History Fact today. Uh, for a couple of different reasons. I want to play a clip from a movie that many of you, if you're over at least 35, you know uh, this movie well. But I want to give honor to Joe Clark. Um, Fair East Side High is not just the start of a, a magical, um, fictional theme song to a school. It represented the work that Joe Clark was able to do in the movie Lean On Me. Um, they, they highlight his efforts in Newark, New Jersey to turn schools around so much so that he was invited to become a White House policy advisor on education. He decided that he would not join the White House administration because he had so much love, concern for his children and the students that he had been tasked with um, providing resource for and leading and guiding, he decided to stay home. We wouldn't see that level of dedication uh, many cases today. Uh, and, and so I honor his life and his legacy. He just passed at the age of 82. Um, this brother carried a bat around the hallways. He was on the cover of Time Magazine as a principal. Many critics challenged his methods. He was a, a drill sergeant, former drill sergeant before entering into education. And so he brought many of those tactics and approaches with him. Nonetheless, he said, look, I carried this bat uh, not to, to, to threaten students or uh, inflict bodily harm, but to let them know you have, you have some options here. You can hit a home run or you can strike out, but this bat represents your choice. And so I'm gonna make sure every time you see me that you see a choice, you see your opportunity to uh, be a star and, and, and knock the ball into the stratosphere um, or look back at the catcher and the umpire and recognize that you missed your shot. His work literally became a model uh, that was put together in a book Joe Clark's uh, principles and techniques um, were used across the country to reform schools. We look at individuals now here in the Philadelphia school system where we're broadcasting like uh, Otis Hackney and others who uh, dedicated their lives to this level of instruction and administration. And so as we talked about education with Dr. Johnson, I think it's also important to know there are many who stand on the shoulders of uh, administrators like Joe Clark, and they bring their own methodology and approaches to the issues of the day. Indeed, there are many, but we're thankful for the work of Joe Clark and what he did um, to ensure that Newark, New Jersey and the world uh, could see the, the promise in our children um, and that they had an opportunity and environment to grow. And so he is our Black history fact of the week. Please make sure you share his story, not just the movie, with our children and those you love. And so for our song of the week, I'll play a very familiar scene from the movie. My, my, my. I 
Aren't you my little songbirds from the cafeteria? Weren't they with you? Who, these guys? <laughs> well, I'm sure you've learned the school song by now. You better know it. Because this time, if you don't get it right, you're suspended for 10 days each. Now, is that clear? Is that clear? Yes, sir. All right, then. The school song. Let me hear it. All right, fellas. Let them hear it. change the school song like that. Let her answer. Well, sir, the children thought the song was a bit boring. Boring, huh? Mrs. Powers, I have never heard a school song like that, and I certainly never authorized you to change it. Did I? Did I? No, you didn't. I want everyone in this school to learn that song in English and Spanish immediately. Take a bow, Mrs. Powers. You've rewritten our alma mater. So, all right, I had to, I had, I had to pull out a napkin or two. I, something I got wet somewhere around this this left eye. Uh, for those who know that that movie, uh, that's an amazing moment. And I need you to know that principals like. Dr. Johnson, teachers like my mother, Cheryl Boyd, and others, they were they're they're committed to to our students. They're they're really committed to our children. Those kind of moments happen all through our school system. And I need you to know whether it's the roughest school or the best school, when teachers care and they give from their hearts, when administrators care and they give from their hearts, we have those kind of moments that change lives really changed lives, not just for the instructors, but for our children. And so it's really crucial because we're not getting that on Zoom. I need you to know our children are not getting that from online instruction. It's going to be really important that we we kind of clear this COVID climate and get our children back um, to where they can feel the love and care and instruction from administrators like Joe Clark. And so our, our hearts and uh, hats and, and our love go out to the legacy of Joe Clark. We'll make sure that we post his information on our social media pages so that you can share that with those that you love. Now I'm going to our next, our next group of juggernauts. Now, it's not enough. This is their words. I want you to hear this. It's not enough to produce art and fashion. We want to inspire the mind that will change the world. As such, we foster artistic expression, leadership abilities, 
tolerance, community engagement, imagination, wellness, safety, and other civic responsibilities. Taisha Brown and Vanessa Young are currently serving over 1,000 plus children and families in underserved and underdeveloped communities, teaching uh, skills through art and providing a variety of therapeutic in interventions because I, depression exists, boredom exists, anxiety exists, especially now with COVID, having to learn online, do phys ed online. Uh, I mean, some amazing things that our children are going through, uh, esteem issues, grief and loss, stress, all of that exists in our child's environment, how we deal with that. Those tools aren't always just what we're able to say to them or motivate them through our typical instruction. We have the arts. It is available for us to create a world of change. These two are doing just that in the space. And so I honor our next guest. <laughs> Taisha Brown and Vanessa. Oh, here. Listen. <laughs> see, see, you are now know how this is going to go. My apologies. <laughs> I, I didn't know. I didn't know. Uh, so, Lakanda forever. All right. <laughs> it is great to see both of you. Welcome home. Thanks, man. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you. It's nice for you to have. All right. So, the first thing is, I need one of them sweatshirts. I don't know why y'all, like, y'all going to show all the hot stuff and never ever pass <laughs> off. Y'all can do that. I know y'all got the duo thing going on, but a brother wants to be, I, I can be the flavor flave. Of the group, all right. I can hype y'all up. So, we got you. <laughs> you're doing, you're doing amazing work. Amazing work. Art is indeed one of the love languages of the human experience. Not only are we able to tell stories, we're able to evoke emotions. Uh, we're able to give perspective that others may not see. What brought the two of you to art of all places? How did you come together to create such a powerful organization? Uh, I've, I've uh, been dibbling and dabbling in art and fashion pretty much all my life um, as a means to support myself. And uh, kind of as a youth, I would, uh, you know, we all have things we want and mom can't necessarily get them immediately. Um, so it's like, I'll just create my own. And then people would see things and it'll be like, oh, I'll buy one too. And that would be a way I could finance myself. Um, but I honestly, I was a very probably greedy person in that way because I always had like stuff coming in, but I never really thought about the bigger picture of people and that connectivity that we all have and, and should honor. Um, and then I met Tisha while we were both working at this place and uh, it kind of, she kind of got me to thinking about how using my gift could be not just beneficial to me, but beneficial to humanity as a whole, not being so self selfish and, and start being more selfless with, with the art I was producing and more so the purpose of why we were producing art and things like that. So 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 Tisha, you're like the uh accountability partner. I am. I really am. <laughs> so so you like uh you you're the perfect role in the Tyler Perry movie, right? With, with the, the big sister that comes in and says, you know, there's so much more for your life. It's like, yeah. And, yeah. and talk to your friend and said, look, the, I, I see all of the opportunities that exist. Let's get down this road and let's make impact. And you guys are doing just that. But not only did you encourage, you got involved. I did. Um, so I'm, I've always been a creative person. I more so do a lot of writing. So I've done um, short stories. I do a lot of poetry and things like that. So when Vanessa, when we started looking at creating this program and I know what art did for me as a child, you know, being able to express myself in a way where no one else probably wouldn't even understand. You know, um, I, I struggled with vulnerability really young. And so for me, it was like, oh, if I just get to write in this down, whether it's in a journal or it's in a poem, um, mm. then I feel better. So we we came together, we combined. I'm always learning. I always told myself I'm a professional student. My, my family will tell you that. Yeah. Uh, and so when we got together, it's like, oh, I could I could learn this stuff. You know, we could learn how to to incorporate what we already have naturally um, into into this business world, into social work. I, I my background started in social work. I did a lot of um, child welfare stuff. So a lot of 
my experience came from that. And so when we decided to come together, it was like, okay, we could use that social aspect with the creative piece. Um, I'm licensed as a, as a therapist. So we incorporate a lot of those therapeutic techniques and working with, with the kids and our population. We've, we've, ex we've expanded to families. Uh, so, yeah. You know, it's amazing. I was looking at an article and this happened um, some months ago around Baltimore schools and they were doing yoga and meditation as a means for an alternative to detention. Yes. They were talking about the impact that came from, you know, sitting some kids down, playing some music, using the Calm app or whatever they used, uh, mm -hmm. but bringing, bringing them together in a peaceful atmosphere, one that was reflective. Uh, and so I see what you're doing as really like the same, if not more, because it's not just being reflective and coming into a more calm space, but saying now let's explore some gifts. Right. Let's express ourselves in a different way uh, because you just never know what comes out of that. And so in this journey, talk about the promise that you have seen from children that you've experienced coming through the program and some of those life-changing opportunities that have occurred as a result? Uh, I know personally, um, I've had a couple of moments recently where it, it really affected uh, how I view what we're doing. Um, originally, I thought that, you know, we would paint with a couple of kids and we had these small workshops and it was like, okay, we'll teach some, some children how to paint. And now we have like 80 year old women coming on our Zooms on Tuesday, 60 year old women. And it's bridging a, a, a gap between families where a grandmother can paint with her granddaughter or a grandmother can experience some type of healing experience with her child or, or, or a grandson can experience that. And just being in the vicinity of his family and them overhearing maybe a Zoom call might mm -hmm. change dynamic within that household. So, you know, it started with just thinking like, all right, we might impact one or two kids, one or two kids learn how to paint really well. And now I'm seeing more of a community being built. Um, it, Power Paint has given me a family that I never really had. So wow. the students that I teach became like my nieces and nephews, I pull up on them and, and bring them gifts and, and they try to hug me. And I'm like, no, it's COVID. We can't, yeah. we can't right now but i also joe clark them too and and the parents call me and, and they're like this one's cutting up and i and yeah. i can be rough so i'm like man you, 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 you can get locked up we, we watch scared straight with children, you know right, right into the studio and let them watch scared straight but we also uh get on and play video games with kids and, and bridge not just a, a community gap within Philadelphia, but there's kids that are in other states that can meet a child in Philadelphia or children in Philadelphia who might grow up to become vi ri ri rivals. Mm -hmm. They can become friends and, and instead of growing up and maybe having a dispute that becomes fatal, you know, they're, they engage in humanity now with one another. So, you know, in, in high school, if somebody bumps a, a, ch a young child he might say, hey, I, I remember you from a Zoom call. I'm not going to shoot you. Yeah. Yeah, let's see how we can de-escalate this situation. I, I'm still mad because you bumped me, but I'm not going to shoot you right off the bat because I remember you were painting with me and Miss Vanessa. Yeah. Ago. So let's slow down a little bit. But, you know, just hopefully we can have that impact and uh, grow our family and, 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 and get some more people who think like us who really want to help these children. And it's not just for like, for the cool hoodies, you know? Right, right. <laughs> Although I still want one. Don't leave, <laughs> yeah. don't leave, don't leave bro. No, but, you know, as you were talking, I, I thought about the mural arts program right here in Philadelphia. Um, the opportunity for young people to be prepared mm -hmm. to do murals, to beautify the city, to play a role in some of these large scale projects that exist uh, in the space, right? Um, and And, and showing them that they can go from an eight by 11 canvas to the side of a building, representing the community, giving some vibrance to a park, you know, these kind of things. Um, but then I also thought about the missed opportunities I had as a grandson to be able to paint with my grandmother when she was in a home. 
or my grandfather when he was in a senior home. Like we always go in and we just hang out, you know, maybe eat some of their food, put a little more salt on there because they don't do they don't do it right over there. But there was an opportunity for me to be creative with him mm -hmm. and, and maybe have an experience over Canvas. And so when we talk about families in the middle of COVID, what are some of the ways that we can use art to communicate with the vulnerable members of our community, our seniors, um, the ones in our family who who aren't, we aren't able to necessarily be around because of the distance or the vulnerability, but maybe we can use art to communicate with them. Do you guys have ideas around that or are you already doing programs that allow us to, to, to address those issues? Yeah, yeah. so two things. Um, we, we currently have a program that is sponsored by an organization called EMAIR, um, and they, they have uh, kind of sponsored uh, the power of paint and allowed it where we can deliver packages to, to enter interested participants completely free. All they have to do is sign up and we will get them a package delivered to their door, either in person or via USPS. Um, and then they could come on the Zoom calls and paint with us. We also have YouTube where you can go and watch tutorials. And I teach about not just art, but sustainability within art. You should use how to use different materials and uh, just kind of be protective of this, this great world that we live in, but still use art. But there's also things like Tisha said, we can we can write and be pen pals to some of our our uh, older participants or younger, younger family members. And um I think writing and, and sending Christmas cards, well, not Christmas cards, but cards, you know, decorative cards or just writing and just using art to engage in a humane way. So basically what you just said was Blue Mountain, look out, like Hallmark, back it up. <laughs> Power yeah. Paint is getting ready to create a new industry on, on ways to communicate. And, and I think it's, it's, uh, it's such a dope idea. I really, really, really love uh, what you're doing. So, so Tisha, clearly, I mean, you are, um, you're, you're, you're the brain trust of, of <laughs> this. I mean, you're bringing it together. You're looking at the opportunities, the talent that exists, the capabilities and saying, Hey, here's our impact as 2021 comes. A lot of it is unknown. We definitely don't know what the arts budget will look like in the city of Philadelphia alone, let alone inside of, you know, 440 in our schools. And so programs like yours become absolutely crucial to expose our children to the arts. What are the ways that the broadcast audience can support the power of paint in these great programs that you have? Uh, so we are open to um, supplies. We use a lot of supplies, um, um, of course, sponsorships. So like Vanessa says, Amir is one of those organizations who stepped in and what, you know, pay for those costs up front and we deliver these supplies. So we take donations. You could go on our website. Um, there's a donate button that will, you know, link you to our PayPal page and you could donate that way. Um, um, and it's tax deductible. We are 501c3. Mm -hmm. So um, being able to do a lot of that volunteer, um, you know, any services, any materials that you've had, we've had people, you know, that had art studios that they had to close up because of COVID and they had leftover supplies, you know, so just delivering a lot of those things to us is, is beneficial as much as um, whatever you can, just reaching out, just spreading the word even. We have so many children that, and families that don't know this exists, you know, that there are free programs where you stay home, you have supplies delivered directly to you and, that's it. You just log on, right? Uh, so being able to hit like hit share, send the button, pass this on to someone you know, um, and, and to Vanessa's point earlier, just about the connections with families, right? The vulnerability. Oftentimes we don't give children the opportunity to know if they even like this stuff. We condition them to to go in one direction or the other. So being able to offer that experience, even just once, say, hey, just try this class. It's free on Tuesdays. Mm -hmm. Goes. We have these conversations. We have five-year-old talk to us about grief and loss and yeah. trauma, you know, and have the, that depression even. So, so in a space where it's not, you know, oh, you're in therapy and there's a stigma. And that's a whole different thing about, you know, stigma and mental health and how we address that. But being able to sit with grandma, sit with mom, and have mom be vulnerable, 
you know, have those conversations to say it is okay to feel these emotions because we have been taught that negative emotion is a bad thing. We shut it down. We run from it. We, we pretend it's, it, it, it's not there. So to right. have conversations with, with families and you could look to mom, you could look to dad, you could look to grandma and uncle and say, oh, it's okay to feel like this. That's that's yeah. normal. You know, that, that doesn't mean something's wrong with me. And we're doing this through art and creative writing. And so sometimes people hear art and they're like, oh, I don't like to draw. I don't like to paint. You know, it's like it's we do so much more so, than that because it's expression and it's tapping into, you know, it's finding other ways to say because sometimes we don't know how to say what we're feeling in that moment. And so we can't expect a five year old to tell us how they're feeling or an eight year old. So being able to offer a lot of these means where they are relaxed, they're comfortable, they're doing something they enjoy. And our conversation is so relaxed that yeah. we get so much from it and a relationship in turn um biz and and the connection we've seen over the the two years we've been doing this the connection we've seen with children from different neighborhoods from different they support each other there's no competition you know they talk to each other they play online and you know someone talks about sadness the other one jumps in and say oh, i've been there and these are seven year olds so so to be able to see that um it, it gives me the energy to sleep three hours a day be like listen yeah. we, we have to do this because yeah. it's bigger than us vanessa and i say it all the time like what we are doing is bigger than us and another thing uh, um to add you you were speaking to organizations like uh like neuro arts um jane jane is one of i guess one of the people i would say i really look up to i don't know her personally but i I could imagine what it's like for a person to build an organization in the, in the 80s, be a woman and build an organization in the 80s. To speak to that, um, I, I know that there's a lot of black women, young black girls that look like Tisha and I, and we don't have any reference point, you know? So it, it was a powerful thing to be able to give people a reference point to say, hey, you don't necessarily have to become a city worker or you know, a, a postal worker, because I was given very limited options as to what my potential was, Malik. As as brilliant as people always said I was, I think we do a lot of black children a disservice, a, a lot of minority children a disservice with, with kind of limiting their potential and telling them, oh, get a pension or do right, this. Right. So we, we both really wanted to push entrepreneurship amongst our students. We, we, have mentorship programs like Philly Mentor Network. We show children how to develop businesses, how to file LLCs, how to formulate their own nonprofits, but and not just make money, but also be of service to their community. Yeah. Because um, what I didn't get from Tisha, I learned from uh, people like Les Brown and, mm -hmm. and Nightingale, and they'll tell you the best way to make your money is to to have value, to give value to the world. So yeah. we kind of give the most value to the people of Philadelphia and, and globally as we can, hopefully we can start going to other countries and painting with kids in Africa and Zimbabwe and things like that. Yeah, our uh, our community, they're looking, I'm looking at the comments, you know, comments range from, you have to see these ladies in action, fantastic, to uh, these women are beautiful on the inside and out. Truth is the both of you are absolutely beautiful. We love you. We honor you and appreciate uh, the work that you're doing for our community. Without you guys, uh, the world will be a different place. But we're thankful for all that you're doing. And so we'll make sure that we post all of your information on our social media pages. We'll pump it up um, and and maybe show up for a paint class or two. And, you know, y'all probably don't want to see the end result of how I move. You know, mine is more impressionist <laughs> than it's, uh, realistic, but um, we'll, we'll definitely support we're down at Granahan uh, Playground on 65th and Callahill painting. We're doing the mural work down there. Um, we are. Uh, we want to shape it where we have like heroes, living heroes down there. People you could see in your neighborhood. So um, if people have people they could nominate and send them into our email, okay. we send them in and we would love to see that neighborhood kind of be transformed into a, a nice representation of the people who live there, but it'd be input from the people who are there, you know? I love you know, that. And so we'll make sure, go ahead. No, I was just saying, we don't get to see that. Usually, you know, your legend, when you leave that is, yeah. you know, unfortunately you've passed. So we don't oftentimes recognize the people within our own communities that are doing great work. So yeah, if if you know someone, if the people out there know someone and they want to nominate them, we're more than happy to 
put them up. Give them their flowers while they're still yeah, alive. Exactly. Uh, you are still alive, and so we are honoring you. Oh, so thank you, know, you. guys. Uh, we think you're absolutely amazing, and we'll make sure that we post everything uh, that we can about your organization on our social media pages. Again, not only thank you for all that you do, but we know that there's going to be a prosperous 2021 for this organization and the power of paint. This is home for you. Yes. So whatever you have going on, by all means, come home and share it with the Heart City family. We'll do everything we can to push it out to the masses. Thanks. Thank you, Malik. Appreciate it. Thank you. Have a beautiful day. I, I love uh, the work that they're doing through Power of Paint please, by all means, we're going to have it on our social media page. I need you to support, get involved. We push arts and cultural programs all the time, uh, but now more than ever, it's so crucial that we support them because the arts is the first thing to get cut when we talk about funding and crucial and critical times. And so make sure that you support these programs, get them involved in your neighborhoods and uh, all of the activities and possibilities that exist for our young people. Our next guest, Jenna Anise Harris. She's the co-founder of the West Philly Bunny Hop. I know you're like, what in the world is he talking about? It's a great program, a great initiative to ensure that we're, we're dealing with uh, resource distribution. When we talk about food insecurities and aid that needs to happen to our vulnerable communities, how do we do that? How do we ensure that they have all that they need? Jenna is a leader, black queer femme community organizer, using her love of food to connect with neighbors. She is uh, recently brought in Philadelphia, 2015, but she's already in. She, she has a sweatshirt, she settled in. So City of Brotherly Love, uh, know that she is one of yours. I honor her just the same. Jenna, welcome mm -hmm. home. Indeed, uh, <laughs> you heart city. Uh, so I should say, welcome to, to, to Philadelphia. I mean, you're five years in, you're home already, but yeah, I've got awesome. my roots here. Yeah, <laughs> there, you go. there you go. Welcome. Uh, I listen, I love what you're doing. This this concept is, um, is ab absolutely amazing. Talk about the beginning of this program, what made you get involved and say, This is the way that I want to make an impact in the community and why dealing with food insecurity is so important, especially at a crucial time like this. Sure. Um, first, I want to tell you, because we haven't ever talked, my name is actually Gina. And Gina. my, friend, my friends are messaging me, and they're like, oh, no. Uh, but it's I'm, fine. Hey, it's fine friends, friends, if we just I met. Don't, yeah, I, don't want, so. I don't want the beehive on yeah. my head. So let them know. <laughs> Sorry, I got Gina's name right now. I don't want any problems on Black Twitter. Yeah, I don't, you know, it's the end of the year. Anything could happen. Um, <laughs> but, um, but I appreciate, you know, you taking time to bring me on today. Um, so Bunny Hop, we started our work in April of this year mm -hmm. as a response to COVID um, and neighbors not being able to get out to the grocery store. You know, the toilet paper hoarding, all the things that, you know. What, what was up with that? Like, yeah, why were we jacking toilet paper across the country? Yeah, people were worried. You know, I mean, okay. and people get worried, they, you know, act out. But, you know, my myself and Katie Briggs, who's the other co-founder of Bunny Hop, yeah. we decided we wanted to help our neighbors in our media community. And we were already cooking, um, doing community work through cooking, um, had that connection and just wanted to bring it to the parks near our neighborhood. So Cedar Park, mm. Malcolm X Park. So we started um, getting extra produce from like Share Philly, from Philadelphia Food Works, uh, just restaurants who were going to, you know, have excess. Um, so we took that excess and brought it to the park. We made soup. Um, we got some cleaning supplies and we set up tables and just started mm -hmm. distributing. Um, and then it just grew. It just kept growing. You know, um, the need was there before COVID. Right. We've both been doing that kind of work, but not so focused until this year. Um, and yeah, it just kind of grew from being just West Philly to being in Kensington to being in Brewery Town right. um, to helping supply other mutual aid groups who are, you know, looking out for their neighbors. Um, and now we're just looking forward to do continuing in 2021. 
Now, Gina, you were awarded the Cooperator of the Year Award in 2019 from the Philadelphia Area uh, Cooperative Association. So it's, it's very clear your work is being recognized and it has impact. Is this yeah. pre is this prepared food? Is this it like so? Help help me get a picture of what mm -hmm. happens when an individual in need or uh, with opportunity comes to experience all that you provide. Sure. Um, so we do fresh produce. That's oh. our our main thing, and we also do prepared foods. We have a cook team who's uh, taking okay. a holiday break right now, but um, we have a cook team who meets once or twice a week and they um, prepare meals for families um, through Sunday suppers and also some of our community partners and wow. neighbors who, who are in need. We have a bake team that um, really works works out of um, Port Richmond. Um, so and what, do they, what, do you, what do they bake? Um, everything. Um, we just had our last bake sale of the year. We did cookie boxes. We fundraise for Franny Lou's porch. Yeah. Who's trying to buy their building. Um, and in Thanksgiving, we did pie sales and we fundraised um, about $5,000 to go towards our free food distribution. All of our distribution is free food. Um, you know, if we make money, it's just going back into the free, free, free food program. Um, you know, and it's our, mission to serve folks with quality and you know respect you know so we try to get fresh food always out to folks um and then anything extra we can get we definitely like you know push push out right you know what's so amazing about what you're doing uh when we talk about covid and how we've handled not only the pandemic but issues of health especially in communities of color much of it revolves around what we're putting in our system and so when you talk about fresh fruit and, and food, it's absolutely crucial that we have access to the freshest food possible, but then we're also preparing it properly. So we're not cooking out the nutrients. And I know you're, you're probably gonna look at me funny when I say I love my fried chicken, but you know, we can't always cook everything in, in uh, you know, cooking oil and fry everything out. We have to have different ways to make sure that we have um, nutrient rich food. And so, are individuals who are experiencing this concept able to work with the cooking team or the baking team to to get new ways and healthier ways to prepare foods as they transition and become more self-sustaining and, and not so much in need? Is that also an opportunity as well? Yeah. Um, so we're looking at ways to do more interactive um, things with our neighbors, like cooking okay. classes. Um, actually, I have a cooking class coming up through the Free Library and the Rosenbach Museum in February. So that that week's distribution box that we'll be giving to our neighbors and to folks who sign up, they'll be able to also attend a cooking class. Um, with uh, Sunday Suppers, they do give out recipes as well as meal kits. Okay. Um, you know, we partner with them to do a lot of our work because they're a nonprofit and we're still figuring that out. Right. Um, right. So, you know, we have different ways of talking with neighbors about what their needs are directly and asking them, you know, mm -hmm. like some people eat sugar, some people don't, some people are allergic to things, you know, so really making it personal and not just, um, you know, this umbrella, like really getting connected to our neighbors and their individual needs and plugging in. So what's ahead? I mean, 2021, as much as we talked about all the challenges of 2020, 21, is nothing but opportunity. And so what lies ahead for the bunny hop and for you? Yeah, um, this year has been an opportunity, honestly, um, you know, because we don't know, we don't know what was gonna happen. So we just had to take the risk and like jump in, you know, and now looking to the next year, it's about sustaining the work, you know, um, we don't want to start something and then go away um, mm. because the need around food insecurity is ever present, you know, regardless of whether we're in a pandemic or not. So just finding ways for us to keep our volunteers motivated, find ways to get established as an entity so that we can pay some folks who've been putting in the time, mm -hmm. you know, the hours, you know, we don't want people to feel taken advantage of, you know, and it's not, you know, because they're all doing it from the heart, but to be able to like 
provide some sort sort of like you know compensation or like you know whatever it is to the people who are spending so much of their time on top of their work mm -hmm. to do this is important and just really figuring out how to grow in a sustainable way you know we started our first week we were doing about 70 families then we jumped to like 150 then at the height of the summer we were at um probably around a thousand people wow. a week at some point you know making 1200 meals a week the cook team you know um and now we're we're hovering around 350 um okay. but you know we we aren't we aren't all over the city we have our pockets but we could reach more people so like figuring out how to reach more folks how to teach more folks how to um start their own mutual aid work mm -hmm. you know and be informed about how to serve different communities you know not just um viewing it as charity but mm -hmm. you know taking it on as like your personal steward to your neighbors you know um right. and you know giving the charge to look to your left and right and bring everyone up with you i i love that concept looking left and right um many times we tell each everybody to stay focused stay in your own lane you know yeah. your, your own path and, and kind of just put your nose down and grind um but it, it is important for us to know how the our brother and sister is doing on our left and right uh yeah. and, and bringing them with us last question why philly I mean, you could have gone anywhere, you know, Seattle and all, all these other places, Boston and New York, uh, places that not only understand this, but would, would definitely embrace in some pretty unique ways. But you you took the flag and stamped it right down uh, in the heart of our city. And we're forever grateful for that. What made you choose Philly? I moved to Philly from Austin, Texas. Um, I grew up in Albany, New York, but I moved to Philly direct from Austin. And I wanted to come back east. Um, and I wanted to be in a black city, honestly, like I wanted to be in a place where folks were out and proud and black and doing the work. Um, so that's what brought me to Philly. And I couldn't be happier to be here, wow. to be learning from all the different folks I've been able to work with over the five years I've been here. I do hope to spend at least another five years here. This is the first city where I'm not uh, ready to pack up after three years, you know, <laughs> like it. since college, you know? So, you yeah. know, I really do um, love it here, you know, and I feel loved, you know, and I feel supported and it doesn't feel like one of the, some of the people in the previous segment we're talking about, there's no competition between the kids. Like, right. you know, there's, there's so much work to do here and everybody has been like, extremely generous you know and open and that's allowed me to continue to be that way as well and to um be open to being more and more accessible to folks you know in the work that i do we are so glad that you are here and that you've lent uh, your brain power your energy and efforts to not just our community but uh you know to the community at large and so you know, all throughout the comments, everybody's like, this is so dope. <laughs> Carlotta Q said, I, I love all the collabs Bunny Hop is doing. Um, and so it's clear you have a fan base and a supporter base here as well. For those who are in the broadcast audience, but uh, aren't necessarily familiar of how to get in touch with you and connect, give them the ways to access you, Bunny Hop, and the great work that you're doing. Um, we have a website. <laughs> that's, that's probably the easiest way for folks who might not be on social media. Um, it's bunnyhopphl.com. Um, we're we have a very uh, large present on uh, presence on Instagram, and the handle's the same, bunnyhopphl. Um, and our Gmail is the same. <laughs> so yeah. if you need to reach out, um, if you need to reach out, if you have a need, if you have a neighbor in need. If you're trying to figure out how to make the next step to do your own kind of mutual aid work, um, we're here as a resource. You know, we want to help everyone get to the point where you know we don't need to drive because their neighbor, everyone's taking care of each other. Yeah. You know, that's that's what we want to do. And that's what it's all about. Um, yeah. Family goes beyond just that immediate nucleus, but it extends out into our community. And uh, I'm thankful that your program is not only providing the resource, but 
reminding us of that very valuable lesson. Know that we love you, we honor you and appreciate you, and we're going to support you. And so we're going to make sure that we are posting uh, your information on our social media. And then we're going to also get involved as well, because it, it's very clear. You put the clarion call out. We need some donations. <laughs> we need people uh, to engage to make sure that this work continues and that you're able yeah. to, to operate with excellence. And uh, we, we've got your back. Thank you. Thank you so much for having me on today. This Thank is great. You. And listen, tell the crew, Gina, I got it right. <laughs> Towards the back end of the interview. <laughs> hey, we worked through it. That's the thing. We have to work through it. And Won't we do. do it? <laughs> yeah. uh, listen, have a beautiful, beautiful new year. And uh, we're, we're excited about the work in 2021. And we'll, we'll make sure that we're a part of that. Great. Happy new year to you as well. Thank, Thank you. you. So you've heard. Uh, from Gina and the great work that they're doing at, over at Bunny Hop. Look, the comments through our feed. I, I love you guys. I, I love um, the interaction that we have throughout the show. I love the correction. Uh, I, I love what 2020 has brought us. So, you, you know, if you were with us from the very beginning, we started September 9th, uh, 2015. And our conversation was, what do you have to lose? We started talking about politics and the possibilities of an election. We said in February of 2015 uh, that a certain person would be president. And indeed he was, we were ridiculed for that. We were, we lost our black card, so to speak. I still don't know who prints that black card. Nonetheless, we lost it. Um, weren't worried about it because we wanted to make sure that we got through these four years together. And you stuck with us. We started on radio with no lights, no camera, just a booth and we're here four years later out of a broadcast studio full team um and and loving and adoring neighbors community members family friends who support us correct us guide us to the next level i i love each and every one of you i'm thankful for this journey that we have taken um for the journey that, that the creator has given us together so i'm asking you to take care of yourselves take care of each other as we go into this new year know um, that there's so much more that lies ahead for all of us um, and i am excited as i know the rest of the heart city tv team is to take this journey with you together we are going to be fine i need you to know that covid has impacted us and changed our lives as we know it, but know that there are opportunities that lie within this field. And so as we mind the field and pull out these opportunities, let's make sure that we share them. We take care of each other through them. Uh, and we make not just our community, but the world a better place. You have the ability to do it. Know that this show was never built on us. This show was built on you. We highlight you every week, the great work that you do every day to make sure that our community is a better place. And so we would not have the level of programming that we have if you weren't doing the work. It's always been about you. And so we're excited to take 2021 by storm, knowing that you are going to lead the way and we get a chance to spotlight every amazing thing that you do and so with that said go into this new year strong go into this new year sure of who you are and whose you are know that while you may not have the money you want or the resources know that all of it is around you in some way shape or form it's in your rolodex it's in your phone book it's on your ig it's in that clubhouse room not the not that one but the other one Make sure you utilize all of those resources to take care of the goals and the milestones that are waiting for you. We will walk with you every step of the way. More importantly, we're thankful and honored that you have walked with us every step of the way. And so shout out to all of the great comments. Sonia uh, Sessoms, uh, thank you for your work. Happy New Year. Greater is coming. Yes, indeed, because you are a part of that as well. Kim Smith, change in progress starts with the conversation. Indeed, it does. Keep up the great work. Thank you, 
we will do just that. Here's what we need you to do. Um, same way you guys took care of Malcolm. You can hook us up as well. All I need you to do is subscribe today. Become a part of the Heart City family. Receive updates, notifications, bonus content, and more. It's all right there on our YouTube channel. Make sure you subscribe and click the button to get the notifications uh, so that you know when we broadcast next. By this time next week, we'll be on the other side with the new opportunity to make impact for time to come. You can find us on social media, Twitter, Facebook, and Instagram at Heart City Radio. And as always, feel beautiful, look beautiful, and act beautiful. Why? Because you truly are beautiful. Happy New Year.